Good evening. My name is Tim Andrews, and thank you for joining our live interactive telephone town hall. We're hosting tonight's event to give Congresswoman Spanberger the opportunity to hear directly from you and to answer your questions about the issues facing Central Virginia veterans and their families as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as I mentioned, this is an interactive forum. Congresswoman Spanberger and the experts she has on tonight will be taking as many questions as they possibly can during this live event. If you have a question and you're joining us by phone, you can simply press star three on your telephone keypad at any time, and you'll be placed in line to speak with a member of our staff. They'll take down your name, where you're calling from, and the next time you hear your name, you will be live on the call and able to ask your question directly. Now, you can also ask a question by submitting one through the portal right below our online streaming player. You can join us at spanberger.house.gov. Again, that's spanberger.house.gov slash live. Now, if you're watching on Facebook Live tonight and would like to ask the Congresswoman a question, we encourage you to visit that online streaming portal so you can submit your question. Again, that's spanberger.house.gov slash live. Now, we could receive a lot of questions during this event, so if we're not able to address your specific question, please call our district office at 804-401-4110 anytime during normal business hours. Again, if you have a question, though, throughout the event and you're joining us by telephone, simply press star 3 on your telephone keypad, or if you're joining us online, just type them right below the streaming player. Now, I'd like to start off this live interactive town hall by welcoming Congresswoman Abigail Spans Spanberger. Congresswoman? Hello, everyone. I'm Abigail Spanberger, and I thank you for joining tonight's virtual telephone town hall focused on issues and challenges facing Virginia's uh, veterans. I hope you and your family are doing well, staying safe, and looking forward to a calm and reflectful Memorial Day this Memorial Day weekend as we remember our service members who we've lost. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to remember former Senator John Warner, who passed away earlier this week, and I would be remiss if I did not touch on Senator Warner's commitment to our nation's service members and veterans, a commitment he demonstrated certainly through his own military service as a veteran of both World War II and the Korean War, um, a commitment he continued to demonstrate as Secretary of the Navy and through his renowned leadership on the Senate Armed Services Committee. After his 30 years in the Senate, I greatly appreciated the honor of getting to know him and receiving his guidance and mentorship at the beginning of my term in Congress. I know Senator Warner would have a lot to say on tonight's calls about the challenges and questions that may be facing Central Virginia's veterans, uh, because I know that he deeply cared for every person who ever put on our nation's uniform. So tonight's event is focused on the challenges and any questions that our Central Virginia veterans may have. Uh, questions and challenges their families, their caregivers uh, may also have. Certainly throughout the pandemic, my team has heard from hundreds of veterans who have really struggled in the face of COVID-19. And I know that many have experienced continued issues with accessing healthcare and securing benefits. And if you have a specific request or question about your case at the VA, please do not hesitate to be in touch with my team and call my office at 804-401-4110, or you can go online at spanberger.house.gov. In Congress, I've been focused on our nation's economic recovery in the wake of uh, COVID-19, and I know our region's veterans are really going to be at the heart of that recovery. In the American Rescue Plan, which I voted to pass and President Biden signed into law earlier this year, we secured an additional $14.5 billion for VA healthcare systems and services. And much of this funding will be directed towards veterans who may have had delayed care or who've experienced more complex healthcare needs as a result of this pandemic. Additionally, the American Rescue Plan provides new resources for veterans receiving housing support and including homeless veterans here in Virginia. The legislation also focuses on reducing the VA's backlog of compensation and pension claims, which grew from 76,000 in March of 2020 to more than 212,000 by March of 2021. Um, I am staying focused on making sure that veterans benefits uh, are paid out and that this backlog is reduced. Uh, 
Tonight, I am joined by Ben Shaw, who serves as Central Virginia Regional Director of the Virginia Veteran and Family Support Program at the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. We're also joined by John Henry, who serves as the Assistant Regional Manager for the Central Virginia Region at the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. I'd like to thank both of our guests for agreeing to help answer the questions uh, we may hear tonight. And before I finish, let me all say, also say thank you so much for your service. Thank you to the service of every veteran on the line uh, and to every family member who's listening in. Thank you uh, for supporting our nation's service members and veterans. Thank you so much for your selfless sacrifice. I'm gonna now turn the floor over uh, to Ben to begin with some introductory comments and then we'll go to John. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ben. Good evening, Congresswoman. Thank you for the opportunity to um, join you and hopefully join some of your constituents and, and uh, hopefully give helpful information to, to whoever is listening in. Uh, I will not uh, discuss the entire Department of Veteran Services agency as a whole because it would take too long and there's other things to do this evening. But I will focus very briefly on what we do in Virginia Veteran and Family Support Program, which is the service line that I represent. Fundamentally, we are fixers, we are linkers, we are connectors, uh, and our job is to provide peer and family support air coordination and community resource linkages for National Guard service members, reservists, veterans, and their families. So that's that's a lot of people. That's, that's again, National Guard, reservists, veterans, and their families here in the Commonwealth. That's well over a million people. Our job mm -hmm. is to answer your question and get you where you need to go. As I will say about the agency, we are certainly a port of entry, perhaps the best, I believe, port of entry for veterans seeking answers to their questions or support or help here in Virginia. But fundamentally, in Virginia Veteran and Family Support, our role is to make sure you get to whatever's out there that may be available to you. Um, and I can tell you that almost every single person in, in my program is a veteran him or herself or an immediate loved one of a veteran. We have a real personal connection to the people we serve. I've been doing this for a very long time, and, and provided they don't fire me, I'm going to stick around with it. So thank you again, uh, Congresswoman. I appreciate it. And uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Congresswoman, for, have, for inviting me tonight. I am John Henry. I am from the benefit side of the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. My main function is to assist veterans and their family members to file claims to the VA. We are the middleman between the veteran and the, and the Veterans Affairs. Please keep in mind, we are not the VA, although we do work closely with the VA to assist in getting claims submitted, getting claims adjudicated to include appeals. We also provide sound guidance when a uh, a claim is denied. We also assist in providing the proper paperwork to get your claim re-looked at or even get you to the appeals board. Also in our arena, we have uh, lawyers on ground that will assist you in uh, getting your appeal completed properly and hopefully getting adjudicated in your favor. We are we are all we are back in the office uh, Monday through Friday now. So if you, if we can be of any assistance to any of you, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you very much. And moderator, we're ready for our first question. Terrific. And if you have a question this evening, uh, you have two, two ways you can ask. Uh, if you're joining us by phone, simply press star three on your telephone keypad. And if you're joining us online, you can simply type your name and question right below the streaming player. Again, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can this evening. And our first question comes from Fredericksburg. Uh, Joseph McElroy is on the line. Yes, sir. Appreciate you holding. You're live with the Congresswoman. Uh, hello, uh, Congresswoman Spanberg, uh, Joe McElroy. Thank you for this time. I, uh, Thank you. I wanted to bring to your attention that uh, as a totally disabled veteran over the period span of period 1984 to 2001, when I applied for the service-connected disability uh, and it was ultimately approved, uh, whether the application was approved or denied, uh, the decision, approval or denial, came with an explanation. Uh, now that the Mission Act has been wonderfully enhanced or uh, enhanced caregiver support, the uh, applications that are submitted uh, when the decision is made whether uh, should it be a denial or even if that denial is appealed, uh, 
you are told that there was, you are denied, but there is no explanation. And that makes it virtually impossible to appeal. Uh, it was the VBA that established uh, the disability service-connected disability system. Uh, it's the VHA, the health care subset of the VA that uh, manages the process of caregiver applications, and uh, it, they do not seem to offer the same opportunity for fair adjudication. Well, Mr. McElroy, thank you so much for bringing this issue to uh, this conversation. And certainly my office uh, stands ready to assist any veteran who's facing challenges with the VA system um, or receives a denial that they wish to appeal. Um, but I think that you make an important point that it becomes very challenging for veterans to be able to appeal um, the results without full details about why they received their denial. So at this point, um, with Ben and John, uh, two tremendous advocates for Virginia's veterans, um, I would wonder, gentlemen, would you want to add anything to expound on Mr. McElroy's point? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. McElroy, for asking that question. I would recommend that um, you contact our Fredericksburg office and uh, have a meeting with them because what we can do for you is we can actually look into your VA files and see exactly why the VA denied your claim and give you the proper guidance and what is needed to, um, to have your claim re-looked at. Thank you very much. And Mr. McElroy, if you'd like to follow up, our team can take your number um, and provide any additional information if you need to be connected um, with, uh, with those resources in Fredericksburg. Up next, we have uh, June calling in from Henrico County. Hi, June. Uh, June Eldridge, appreciate you holding. And you're Thank you very much. Console. I appreciate it. And Representative Spanberger, I really appreciate all your emails uh, letting us know what's been going on and how your office has helped all your constituents. That's really been a, a help to all of us. And uh, what you said about Represent Senator Warner, he was such a great guy, and every, I know all Virginians really were upset when he died. Um, yes. My question is, the travel department here in at McGuire at the Central Virginia office has abruptly, as of January, changed their requirements for obtaining transportation services. Up until January of 2021, any veteran who showed a need could obtain transportation services, which I had been getting for the last four years. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we had to fill out a needs question, a simple revised needs questionnaire. And then I had been told that all of a sudden, no, I did not meet their quest, their criteria for getting it, and I no longer qualified for transportation. I asked and I asked and I asked what the criteria were mm -hmm. and what the minimum amount of funds that you could have to get the transportation services. Your travel office refused to tell me what it was. I finally had to go back to the central registration office and have them call transportation. And actually, one of them went to the office, okay. went to the travel office, and demanded to find out what the minimum income requirements were. They changed it from $9,000 to $19,000. Well, who could live on $19,000? I'm sorry. I live solely on Social Security. Based on that amount, on their new requirements, I no longer travel. I no longer require, meet the requirements for travel. However, I solely, I'm a disabled veteran, mm -hmm. and I use have to use for any transportation 
a power wheelchair. I can't wow. drive. My brother drives me from appointment to appointment. He has his own life. I can't get him. I can't expect him to drop everything three and four times a week to take me to appointments at the VA. That's not fair to him. What should I do? I tried calling the DAV. They told me to call the American Legion, of which I'm also a life member of both those organizations. Mm-hmm. I called the American Legion. They said, well, call your local VA, and then I get a message that the American Legion, because of the COVID, no longer was doing travel. The DAV is still not doing any travel or any transportation services. You know, Ma'am? how long can I expect this to happen? Ma'am, you have called the right place. Um, and I, I want to begin by thanking you for your service. I want to um, begin by saying that so unfortunately what you um, are experiencing in terms of the uh, the change and shifts uh, of of uh, uh, in in the real challenges related to getting to McGuire um, during the pandemic is something that um, we have been hearing about, um, and so I I wanted to just let you know that that we hear you, and um, I'm going to see if the gentlemen have any direct information. If not, ma'am, um, my office will follow up and and look into this. Um, this issue for you. But I'm going to uh, defer it over to Ben and John if they have any immediate feedback. Otherwise, we'll be following up with you. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Ms. Eldridge, I um, I, I hear you as well. We, we've heard of things like this too. Uh, transportation is a known issue throughout the state and certainly around McGuire as well. Um, I do not know what the answer will be, but I would be delighted to um, hear more about your situation and then work also with our contacts over at VA and, and help you get a definitive answer of what is something you can rule in or rule out. And also if we can find some community-based alternatives. I realize that sounds vague. Uh, every situation and people's eligibility differ. Uh, we, I would love to help you with that. And all I need is a name and number, which I'm, I'm sure the team can get to me and I will gladly reach out and, and I'd love to help you as best I can. Thank you so much. Up next, we've got a question from one of our uh, online participants. Again, if you're joining us online, uh, you can simply type in your name and your question, if you have one, right below the streaming player. And if you're joining us by phone, simply press star three, and we'll get to as many questions as we can during this live event. William Ferguson uh, typed in this question uh, online. The pandemic has had quite a negative impact on veterans who have PTSD. He's interested in knowing if the VA intends to hire additional psychologists to deal with what is more than likely going to be an influx of patients who need treatment for this specific issue. Well, I'll begin with this one. I I really appreciate this question because it's bringing to light uh, the challenge that so many of our veterans are facing with PTSD, with mental health challenges and struggles, and the real need uh, for mental health services within the VA. Um, Notably, within the American Rescue Plan, the piece of legislation that I mentioned earlier, uh, we allocated billions of dollars um, specific to the VA to ensure that veterans are getting the care that they need, um, in including uh, a a wide array of support. Um, In terms of actual hiring decisions at the local uh, VA hospitals throughout the country, um, I think that will, of course, be um, decisions that are made Uh, location to location, though notably an important um, service that I have been advocating for uh, is the provision of telehealth um, services. And certainly the VA uh, is a a strong advocate for telehealth services, particularly for mental health services. Uh, Representing a district like I do that is um, a, a long uh, a long um, and diverse district in terms of land mass where some of uh, my constituents travel quite some ways in order to be able to get services at the VA. Um, having the option to be able to uh, utilize telehealth, uh, mental health services is incredibly important. Um, so that's uh, outside of the VA system. That's also one of the reasons why I have continued to work for 
uh, broadband access connectivity so that our veterans throughout rural communities uh, can can absolutely access mental health um, and other healthcare um, uh, resources through telehealth. Um, you know, notably, the the challenges of PTSD and, and mental health stressors are uh, prevalent um, and and uh, incredibly uh, worrisome within our veteran community. But it is also um, during the pandemic we've seen uh, challenges related to overdoses, uh, mental health stressors related to addiction. Um, and here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we've had a 40% increase in fatal overdoses. Uh, and so recognizing the significant challenges that our larger community faces, and particularly our veteran community, um, I had um, done a lot of work to ensure that our state and local governments, so outside of the, the VA system, but our state and local governments are able to utilize American Rescue Plan funding for uh, prevention, recovery, um, and addiction-related services, which is in incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and then noting that um, while I want to ensure that every veteran gets the resources that they need uh, to contend with mental health challenges or PTSD, you know, we, we see a staggering uh, reality that far too many veterans uh, have taken their own lives. Um, each day, our nation loses veterans to suicide. Um, and to raise awareness uh, to, to that tragedy uh, and to, to, um, uh, to enable um, advocacy, I introduced a piece of legislation with um, a, a counterpart from Ohio, Republican Congressman uh, Gonzalez from Ohio, that uh, would create Purple Star Family Week. And this is a week to uh, bring awareness to the, the mental health challenges that so many of our nation's veterans face uh, in, in an effort to save lives in the long term. Uh, so Ben, John, if you would care to add anything, I, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, that what you've described is, is an issue that uh, we run into regularly. Uh, sometimes the VA is not the best fit. Sometimes there's a line that's a little bit too long, and that's fine. Uh, by code mandate, it is my job and our team's job to find you alternatives. So I can do this. This is easy. Uh, with your name and information, which I'll get later, I hope, um, I'll give you a call and, and we'll take care of this. We'll connect you with either with the VA directly or somewhere else as appropriate. I can't necessarily commit to it permanently or long, long term, but I can certainly make sure you and others are connected to the treatment you need now. Uh, you don't have to wait. So we exist to help remove or, 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 or crash through these barriers. I'm uh, very happy to do so here as well. So I look forward to hearing from you. Let's go back to our uh, online callers uh, from Henrico County. Uh, Mr. Martin's been uh, holding with a question. Yes, sir. Appreciate your patience. You're live with the Congresswoman. Oh, thank you so very much. Yeah, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a Marine. Uh, uh, joined the Marines in 1966, yeah. and immediately I was sent over to, when I was 17, I went to California, and I turned 18 there, and I went directly to Vietnam. Um, the problem I have is after being there, getting injured, I got shot, and my knee, and I got my feet uh, from a bomb fragment. They were kind of blown up and had to be reconstructed. Uh, when I came back to the United States, um, I had some skin issues as well. And uh, I found out about the Agent Orange. I'm like, oh, crap, we, we were right there. I mean, we were up there in the Quezon, Kalu, Contien, Leo from the border. Um, and then I, I, the U.S. government at initially has said, well, no, uh, no such thing. But gradually they, they, they finally admitted that, well, yes, we, we did this. Um, since that time, I have had uh, continuous skin problems, uh, like cancerous problems. It's not cancer, but it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's horrible. I mean, I, I, my skin is like two or three different shades. I also have got an enlarged prostate, which I know is one of the 
things from that Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, uh, in 1970 or so, uh, whenever they, the government said, okay, we, yeah, we did this, um, and then we can apply for assistance uh, financially. So I did that. And as of yet, he is, 19, he is 2021. I've got nothing from the U.S. government. I'm suffering from this pretty bad skin disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm suffering from enlarged prostate. I'm 73 years old. Uh, I've got my paperwork from the original claim that I filed with the U.S. government, the U.S. District Court, whatever the court is. Right? I still mm -hmm. got it. Got nothing back. But the other issue I have, along with this, is the inability for our government to be honest. Um, in 1966, I was, in the Marine, I was in the National Marines in Vietnam, and they dropped us over the Laotian border during the monsoon season from mm -hmm. helicopter. President Johnson said to the U.S. government and the U.S. people, there has been no American troops in the ocean, mm -hmm. nor will there ever be. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know he said this until I got shot. And I had to go back to the hospital. I got shot in my knee. And I finally got in contact with my father. I said, Dad, uh, he just came back from the ocean border. He told me to shut my mouth because he's an expert ring. Mm. Wow. And I'm going to, what? President Johnson is on TV to the U.S. people saying there have not been no U.S. troops across the, the the ocean border, nor will they be there. I just came from there. I got shot there. And I'm going like, oh, my God. So I'm saying, okay, come on, man. Right now, my my main concern is uh, I, my skin is really, really, really messed up. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got this enlarged prostate. The U.S. government has never, ever stepped up and reimbursed me. This was back to the 19th. I went in in 1966. Come on now. I filed for it in 1970. It's 2021. Mm -hmm. I have yet. I, I, I've got PTSD, so it give me 55%. I got okay. more than that. I got more than that. You don't even know what I went through. Mr. Martin. This is outrageous. I am so upset. I'm disappointed in my government. I'm sad. I was a child when I went in the Marine Corps. I was a damaged child when I came out of there. And I have no recourse. What can I do? I can't fight the government. Mr. Martin? Well, Mr. Martin, I'm not sure if we lost you. Um, but to, I will, okay. Um, if I if I can begin speaking to the the points that you raised and the the questions that you brought up, uh, certainly you and and there were a couple different pieces there. So initially, um, you were speaking about your exposure to Agent Orange, and so your discussion of this issue is 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 um, particularly uh, timely because. The Department of Veterans Affairs just announced uh, two different decisions related to presumptive conditions associated with Agent Orange, in particular matter uh, of military members who've, or uh, particulate exposure for military members. Um, it's important to note that, um, you know, I, I hear you and your experiences, unfortunately, are 
um, not uncommon. For far too long, our veterans who had exposures uh, to Agent Orange were not able, and in your case, uh, still not able to get the support that they need. Uh, last Congress, and, and I, I voted for this legislation, we had the National Defense Authorization Act uh, for fiscal year 2021 um, added additional conditions to the list of presumptive um, associated, uh, presumptively, ex uh, presumptively ex associated exposures and illnesses. Um, those include bladder cancer, hypothyroidism, and Parkinson's. Um, notably, individuals with exposure to Agent Orange uh, demonstrate a, 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 an un, a, a fortunate um, association with these types of uh, life-threatening or life-taking illnesses. Um, and, and though it is many, many years too late, uh, we are now recognizing that and, and we passed that through legislation last year. And uh, now those presumptive associations will be there. Um, Additionally, there's a newly formed internal process within the VA to review scientific information uh, to support rulemaking and make recommendations uh, about the types of illnesses that may be um, that may be associated with a, a, a service member service. Um, and certainly, sir, you spoke about Agent Orange, but right now, uh, many of our veterans who've returned from wars in the Middle East are facing burn pit related exposures. Um, or service-related exposures. I, I have written a piece of legislation focused on military firefighters and the, uh, the potentially fatal exposures that they face through that service. Um, so, so, sir, you know, I know that's not an answer that does not fix your situation, um, but certainly I, I, I do want to say that um, I'm sorry for the years and years that, that you've been fighting this, that you've been ill, that you've been impacted. Um, and, and I do want to let you know that there is some, though limited um, and far too late, progress being made. Um, and then in terms of getting you the support and any other veteran like you who might be listening, the support that you need, um, I would offer up my office as a resource to help you here. Um, and I would also um, open it up to, to John or Ben if they have any um, uh any resources that they might be able to provide, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Mr. Martin, I would, if you haven't enrolled yet, I would recommend you enroll in the Agent Orange Registry. What they will do for you is they will do a physical on you and they will track your illnesses and they will help. Uh, that way, if we do file a claim to the VA for your issues, then we can pull that, um, that that uh, physical and that it helps support your claim. As far as your skin conditions, um, what we, what our office can do is we can help you do the research because all we have to do is prove to the VA that the skin issues were caused by Agent Orange. And that is really an easy thing for us to do um, because the list of presumptives that the Congresswoman spoke about is what the VA is saying that yes, we do know this was caused by Agent Orange. But we all know that there's other side effects from Agent Orange, and we will help you do the research to, uh, in attempts to get your claim success adjudicated if you choose to go that route. So if you don't mind, can you please ensure that Congressman Spanberger's office has your information, and I'll be more than happy to contact you directly and, and assist you in working on getting this accomplished. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. If you have a question for the Congresswoman or either of the experts, uh, Ben Shaw or John Henry that we have with us this evening, uh, simply press star three on your telephone keypad. We're going to try to get to as many live questions as we can. And if you're joining us online, simply type your question right below the streaming player. Uh, up next, Ed Jarvis. Thank you so much for your patience here. Uh, Ed, you are live with the Congressman. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. I'd like to know... Uh how we get the VA to pay the bills for those vendors that are VA certified for us to get our dental or our eye exams away from the VA. There's a process that we have to go through uh, to get permission prior to going to the appointment. And then what happens is the vendor supplies the bill to the VA and 
the VA doesn't pay it in a timely manner, and in some cases, after seven, eight months, we're getting, you know, notified that our stuff is going to a collection agency because the VA's not paying the bill. And, uh, you know, some of us live a long ways from McGuire, so we like the opportunity to do the medical, dental, and eye vision locally. But uh, what happens is the VA doesn't pay, and then we're notified, oh, I'm sorry, we're not in the VA program anymore because uh, they didn't pay us in a timely manner. Thank you. Mr. Jarvis, you raised an excellent question, um, and I'm going to turn it over to either John or Ben if, if they have any feedback on how uh, veterans can handle this situation. Mr. Jarvis, these are hard. Uh, the, the, unfortunately, yeah. this is something that I've heard on a regular basis. Um, you go, you get your care somewhere, uh, they submit the bill, and either they run into your credit card or they never hear back. And obviously a provider has to pay their own bills and they say, forget it. I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not participating in this anymore. Um, I would love to try to assist with this. And I say try because I don't know my success. There are uh, people within every VA system who are supposed to be experts in, in previously the Veterans Choice Program, but now the Mission Act, which is the program under which a lot of these community-based or uh, community referrals is another term for it, uh, fall. Uh, so it's it maybe a matter of finding that person and, and problem solving exactly what happened, who dropped the ball, and if possible, seeing if we can resolve it before you as a consumer are expected to take it up in collections or just, you know, have your credit room. Um, I, this is a tough one. Uh, I would love to give it a shot. Um, it, it's always a learning experience for, for all of our team on cases like this. But all I need is information, and, and I'd love to try this. Thank you. And, and Mr. Jarvis, while um, Ben is going to work to assist you directly, um, I, I will be following up with the VA as well because certainly the problem that you're experiencing is not um, is unfortunately not unique to you, um, and there clearly needs to be uh, an ex expedited or at least a, a faster process within the VA so that veterans like you are not facing these these challenges and then and then ultimately the loss of a provider, let, let alone the financial implications that that you're facing. Congresswoman, our next question comes from uh, one of our online participants, Bob Sempeck. Uh, Bob's question, can you please briefly summarize the veteran issues that you have dealt with and what are the most common issues that you have dealt with? Uh, briefly? I don't know if I can do it briefly. Um, so thank you for this question because this I think it... <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Um, thank you for this question because I, I think it does allow um, us all to have the opportunity to explain um, some of the efforts that we've undertaken on behalf of the veterans that we serve in my congressional office or, or certainly with the Department of Veteran Services. Uh, so our office stands ready to help veterans with any challenges they're facing. We can um, engage with uh, claims and that veterans are pushing through the VA system and we can uh, track your case and be there to assist. Uh, those cases have been as simple as an initial claim. Those cases have been as complicated as multiple, multiple denials. Um, and, and, the, and, you know, without going into some of the personal information about the veterans, but a, a, a scope of information, um, a scope of challenges, uh, particularly related to denial of benefits, um, uh, in, but but particular to um, you know disability claims and initial rejections there, um, and notably we we worked with a, a veteran uh, who's now um, passed away, uh, who was facing some challenges with the VA system, and uh, he was a constituent from Powhatan, and uh, had served our country um, admirably as a military firefighter. And so we, we helped him in the process with the VA, uh, kept uh, working and advocating with him uh, through the process with the VA, but in experiencing and, and advocating for and with him, uh, we found that certainly his circumstance wasn't unique and his experience had been an exposure, uh, multiple exposures as a military firefighter to common firefighter, uh, firefighting um, uh, chemicals. And so in the civilian world, uh, generally, Firefighters, uh, it is clear and recognized from a health perspective that certain exposures that firefighters face 
uh, link them to certain types of cancers. Uh, but that presumption of service-connected disability uh, for military firefighters who do develop certain types of cancers just wasn't there. Um, so we wrote legislation um, in, in, and have introduced that legislation. I continue to push that legislation uh, to ensure that military firefighters have parity with civilian firefighters in terms of the accepted and understood uh, con um, illnesses that may be connected to their service to ensure that they get uh, the veteran benefits that are owed to them. So it's a, it's a whole scope of uh, veterans related issues that our office can help with um, and has and have helped with, certainly um, ensuring uh, faster receipt of, uh, of, of disability payments in particular. Uh, ben and John, would you want to provide any additional information uh, or your office's experiences? As far as, thank you, ma'am, as far as benefits, uh, our experiences um, is mainly dealing is, is mainly dealing with the VA, um, trying to make sure that the VA has everything they need to adjudicate a claim. Um, and once the claim is, in, make sure the claim is adjudicated in a timely manner. Uh, and once that we also ensure that once the claim is adjudicated, the financial payments come right behind that and make sure that the payments are correct. We could also help if something's incorrect or something's denied, we could also help in um, getting that readdressed with the VA. And we have many tools in our tool bag that, um, that we could use to assist and to facilitate in doing that. If I may add uh, one other thing, Congresswoman, uh, I, in Virginia Veteran and Family Support, uh, we typically um, get, get all the calls that don't fit into square boxes, and that's, that's fine, it's what we do. Uh, I would say one of the prevailing themes is that people who call us have some sort of financial need, and that may be a need, it may be the need, but oftentimes it's sort of indicative of a larger picture. Uh, so what we do with every single client is sit down and say, who are you, where did you come from, and how did you get here? Uh, the goal is to understand where they are right now, but also some of the uh, the other factors, situations, circumstances that led to where they are. Uh, we oftentimes find that um, servants, service in the military uh, really sets them up for success for, for many, many years, but it also can, for some people, uh, make things potentially more challenging based on what happened during that service, based on what happened when they get back from that service. Uh, the, the disposition of the American public and how they, they, they accept them, receive them, or do not. Uh, all those things can contribute to someone's wellness, both short and long term. Uh, and our goal is to sort of pick the entire situation, the entire uh, uh, matter or dilemma apart and make linkages and connections and referrals and also individual one on one veteran to veteran peer support as best we can to help get that person to where they want to be as they define health, happiness and success. It's not always a guarantee in any case, but we certainly we try in all cases. Um, a lot of times the system, there, there's no shortage in my sort of, there's no shortage of programs and services and agencies and benefits for veterans, but there's potentially too much in that it can be hard to navigate. It can be confusing. Certainly paperwork is challenging for, for many of us to include me. Um, so our goal is to help uh, cut through all the red tape and, and make that process simpler and very person focused for every single uh, person who calls us. Uh, and the big thing I would say is veterans are human beings above all else. So the, the, the unique needs and, and issues of veterans are not necessarily veteran issues, they're human being issues. Uh, and our goal is to connect them with whatever best meets that need, whether it be veteran specific, military specific or not. Thank you. Up next, we have a live call from Henrico County. Uh, Susan Riveland is on the line. Uh, hopefully I pronounced your last, uh, your last name correctly, ma'am. But you are live with the Congresswoman. Go right ahead. All right, thank you. Um, Congresswoman Spanberger, I remember meeting with you, I believe it was two years ago, um, and we discussed um, issues of military sexual assault. Um, and um, this is an issue that I've been advocating for as a veteran um, for some time and is something that's near near to me. Um, I, I, as I understand it, um, there, I mean, it's been a lot of press about moving investigation and, and adjudication of um, these uh, military sexual assault cases outside of the chain of command um, of the victim's unit 
and um, a review or investigation or whatever it happens to be, um, um, you know, to find justice for these cases, um, moving them to an independent agency. And um, I had heard that there was congressional support for that. And I just wondered um, what's been happening with that and what is your view of this issue? Thank you for this question. It is in, an incredibly important one and certainly very timely. So there is a piece of legislation named in honor of Vanessa uh, Guillen, who was the a, 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 who was a service member who was murdered at Fort Hood, um, and there was an independent commission at Fort Hood uh, to investigate her murder and uh, the. Um, offenses and incidences of sexual harassment that uh, that she faced before uh, her ul ultimate death, um, and to make suggestions to ensure the safety and security of our service members. And as part of this piece of legislation, of which I am a co-sponsor, um, it would, um, among other things, yes, move um, it outside of the chain of command uh, when someone reports uh, sexual assault within the military. It also would make it a standalone military offense for sexual harassment, uh, which is an important first step um, in being able to identify behaviors that, um, as they escalate, can be very dangerous. Um, uh, and as, as, as any victim of uh, sexual assault knows. Um, so uh, across the board, there is significant support and ever increasing support. Uh, for moving investigations outside of and reporting outside of the chain of command. Um, and it is in this piece of legislation um, that, um, that we are pursuing um, that movement in, in addition to other um, efforts to try and um, help, um, help victims, but also ensure um, that, that we're creating um, uh, a, a, a safer system for all of our service members. Congressman, our next question comes from uh, Chesterfield. We have Quasi Johnson on the line. Hello, thank you for holding. Hello, thank you. How you doing, Congressman? Hello. I um, yes, I'm, I have a question. So, I'm a person. I'm not a vet, but I help my cousin out. He served in the military 18 years. He went to war for us three or four times during that time. He went to Iraq. He got messed up feet because he used to jump out of airplanes for the United States government to keep us safe. He doesn't. He's having a hard time keeping a job because he has a lot of pain. He's going through the backlog of the the um getting his benefits done. Yes. He has to pay child support, which makes him now he can't afford to live in affordable housing in Virginia. I wonder, is there any programs that can help this vet that he can get affordable housing, maybe get a job that he can sit down or something? All the things he know how to do is where he has to stand up and use his, and be on his feet. And then he also has, like that other lady, has problems with transportation because, of course, he can't afford to get a car. He has to ask family members for help, and sometimes family members can't drop everything to take him around. So, so I, I want to say thank you for all of your support to your cousin. Certainly thank you um, for his service, for his sacrifice. And um, I'm, I'm sure he's he's certainly lucky to have a cousin like you who's advocating for him. Uh, I'll speak on a couple things from a federal perspective, things I've advocated for and voted on, and, and then specific to the programs that might be able to help your cousin. I'll see if John or Ben would like to add anything. Um, in, in the American Rescue Plan, which I mentioned, um, it provides hundreds of millions of dollars to the Veteran Rapid Retraining Assistance Program um, that is meant to provide assistance to veterans um, who are looking to um, make career changes. Um, hopefully that is a program that your cousin would potentially be eligible for. Uh, it, we also allocated um, millions of dollars to the VA to address the backlog because the, the, the backlog that your cousin is facing for um, his benefits is uh, unfortunately an experience that others um, are experiencing at this time. Um, and then the 
American Rescue Plan also included uh, support to the VA uh, for um, uh, uh, um, rehousing related programs um, or housing related assistance programs. Uh, and so with, with that, I'm, I'm gonna again say thank you so much for your support to your cousin. Um, and gentlemen, would you add any specific programs that he should be aware of? Uh, so, if, thank you, Congressman. So, very, very briefly, uh, Mr. Johnson, um, part of this is a, a John question. John can certainly answer in detail uh, any questions your cousin may have about VA claims, whether it's something that's currently in the hopper or something you wish to do in the future. But as a realize taking notes here, so as it relates to um, you know, issues of stable housing, employment, transportation, um, the fact that he had a job and now he can't do it because his health is deteriorating. Uh, there are several programs that come to mind. Some of them are community-based. Some of them are federally funded through grants or directly through VA. Uh, I would love to have a chat with your cousin and make sure that he's aware of some of these programs. I'm not sure if he's going to be eligible for all of them, um, but you, we will start throwing things at a wall and see what sticks. I, I really do think that there are, there are some programs and services out there for which he will be eligible, eligible and it may help him uh, get back stabilized on his feet, literally. Uh, while also trying to work several longer games with VA claims and other issues relating to housing and employment. So I would love to chat with them. Uh, I'd love to connect with some of my team who work with this, uh, unfortunately, daily, uh, and see if we can engage with not only the new resources coming out and the new services and funding coming out, but also pre-existing and long-standing as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ben. Um, Mr. Johnson, I also want to say thank you for uh, advocating for you on your cousin's behalf. Um, if we had more people like you assisting veterans, we'd have more veterans coming forward to get assistance from the VA. Um, as far as him not being able to hold a job, if we can show that he his feet are service connected and he meets the qualifications, we can assist him in applying for what we call individual unemployability. I definitely would like to talk to your cousin about that. So if you don't mind ensuring that we have some content, if that, Sorry, Congresswoman Spanberger's office has some contact information on you or your cousin, and I'd be more than happy to talk to him about it and tell him what's the qualifications. And if, if he meets the qualifications, then we can assist him in filing the claim and uh, seeing what's going on with also with his current claims that's in the hopper at the VA. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next question actually comes online from a 41 year veteran uh, also a pastor. Uh, his name is Gerald Jacobs. And Gerald's community, uh, question is, Congresswoman, what can the faith community to do to assist your office or veterans as a whole? Um, Reverend Jacobs, uh, Mr. Jacobs, thank you so much for, for this question. And thank you for wanting uh, to advocate on behalf of veterans. Uh, I, I would ask that any person who has a strong community connection, uh, particularly within the faith community, uh, make sure that members of that community, of their church, of their uh, faith organization are aware of the resources that exist for veterans, are aware that we have people in my office, we have people like Ben and John who stand ready to uh, serve those who have served our nation. Um, so we will, after this uh, town hall, be pushing out additional contact information so that people know how to get in touch with our office or how to get in touch with uh, people in Ben and John's offices. Um, and, and please share that information widely. And if there is a veteran who's suffering or facing challenges, please let them know that there are supports available and people who want to help them. Uh, John, Ben, would you add anything else? Yes, Reverend Jacobs. Uh I would advise you that, um, I would just say that we are here as the Virginia Department of Veterans Services on the benefit side. We are here to uh, address any veteran or to assist any veteran. So if you would like to set up some type of a meeting with the veterans, we would be more than happy to brief them on their benefits, on uh, what's out there, what's available to them and their spouses, or even the spouses of, uh, of a deceased veteran because there are benefits out there for them also that most of them do, do not know about. Uh, if you don't mind, please ensure that Congresswoman Spanberger's office has your contact information, and I can definitely reach out to you and uh, offer our assistance to help veterans uh, re tap into the, uh, the 
tap into the resources that we are, that's available to them. Thank you. John, one quick addition to that. Uh, sir, I want to actually say, I'm going to empower you. Um, a lot of people when they get out of the military, especially young Marines like myself, uh, I used to say, I am a Marine. I'm always going to be a Marine. I think like a Marine. But the reality is when I get out of the military at some point, I don't have to start thinking like a civilian because I am a civilian. Um, so I think uh, um, as, as a leader in your community, a leader in your church, and someone who's also a veteran, you have a unique level of credibility with other veterans, especially younger ones or older ones, I suppose, transitioning out of the military. You can shepherd them through what, can also, what has oftentimes been a difficult process. And I can tell you personally, uh, when I got out of the military and I was pushing people away left and right and, and disinterested in hearing anybody's good advice, ultimately the person, the single person who got to me and who I trusted and I felt was credible was both a reverend and a combat veteran. And, and I let him kind of let him in. Um, he offered me some fantastic mentorship. Uh, and I believe you probably have that skill and capability and position right now to do that. So I'd encourage you to probably keep doing what you're already doing uh, and simply uh, and spread out your tendrils further. I would love to have a chat with you as well, in addition to John, just to see if we could sort of uh, make, make others aware of what you're doing right now. Uh, thank you. Congresswoman, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, we're gonna go to Jay Luster, who is live on the phone. Hi, Mr. Luster, thank you so much for holding. You're live with the Congresswoman. Hi, thanks for um, thanks for this. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'll keep it very brief. Um, I started filling out a claim form online and I ran into some questions that required something more than just a simple answer. Um, and I don't know what to do. And so I need some help, you know, filling out the claim. So who do I turn to for that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luster. Gentlemen. Uh, good day, Doug. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mr. Luster, our office will be more than happy to help you because uh, I, I've been doing this job about six and a half years. And I do understand that trying to do your claim online, you do run into some snafus and some there's questions on these forms that requires an answer that nobody can explain to you if you uh you don't mind ensuring that uh congresswoman spanberger's office has your contact information what we will do for you is we will actually do the forms for you we will mm -hmm. get your claim submitted after you sign it um so we're here to support you with claims support you and any other veteran that has claims and as i tell other veterans i recommend you stay offline and see a veteran service representative and let us help you. That way we know the forms are completed right and the VA has all the information they need to adjudicate your claim. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I wanna say thank you, uh, Mr. Lester, for, for your question, uh, because I think it speaks to the heart of, of so much of what we've discussed today, which is we have veterans across our community who continue to face challenges, be it with the, the initial paperwork uh, to ensure that they're getting the benefits that they've earned through their service. Um, or as we've heard um, as well, that um, veterans like Mr. Martin, who entered on duty back in 1966, uh, who's still facing challenges within the VA system. I, I hope that the takeaway for everyone on this call is that there are uh, many people who are here to help and focus uh, from a federal perspective, legislating, uh, be it related to Ms. Ryland's question about sexual assault in the military uh, and protecting uh, victims and, and uh, protecting our military members, uh, to whether it's uh, Mr. Jarvis's question about how to get uh, the, the services that he receives outside of the VA paid quickly so that he's not uh, potentially risking losing uh, those relationships with, uh, I believe the example he gave was a, a, a dentist. I welcome anyone who has any challenges to be in touch with my office, 804-401-4110. Uh, we help with federal agencies. That's one of the elements and responsibilities that I have, that my team has uh, as your member of Congress. I'm so grateful that we had um, uh, Ben Shaw and John Henry on the line today as well from the Department of Veteran Services speaking to what is happening uh, here locally within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, these services are here to support our community's veterans. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I welcome you all to be in touch. My office is 
4110. Uh, we will assist you in any way that we can. Um, and we're just so appreciative. I'm so appreciative to have uh, John and Ben on the line today as well, uh, providing their incredibly important insights and, uh, and resources. And, and as we head into this Memorial Day weekend, um, I know many of the veterans on the line uh, will be remembering someone that they served with or someone that they knew. And so as we head into this Memorial Day weekend, I wanna say again, thank you to everyone who served, but this weekend, our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers will most certainly be with uh, the service members who never returned home. So please stay safe, everyone. And uh, we, we look forward to being of service uh, to you, the constituents of Virginia 7th District. Thank you. We are coming to the end of our live event this evening. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this important veteran-focused telephone town hall with Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger. We appreciate the opportunity to answer your questions, but if we were unable to get to your specific question this evening, or if you'd like to follow up on a question you may have asked to get more information about how to get in touch with Ben Shaw or John Henry, uh, simply contact Congresswoman Spanberger's office, 804 401 4110 during normal business hours, or you can go to spanberger.house.gov. Thank you again. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great evening.